I am super excited to be here. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Um, all right. Can you see? Amazing. Okay, well, I am going to be talking today about unleashing your team's potential to maximize organizational problem solving. Um, just a quick introduction. So my name is Sarah Tilkins. Um, I am a senior manager of operational excellence at GE Healthcare. I work in our imaging segment. I am also the CEO and founder of the KPI Lab, where I help manufacturing organizations find new ways to problem solve. I am a certified executive coach um, through both Coactive and the International Coaching Foundation uh, and a Six Sigma Black Belt. So I am obsessed with problem solving. So I can't see everybody, but I want you to do me a quick favor and raise your hands. You don't have to raise your um, hands on the Zoom, just like raise your actual hands, like show me your hands. <laughs> okay, now I want you to raise them higher. And higher. And raise them higher. And now I just want you to reflect how many of you started with your hands all the way up. And I would offer that you might have, you know, used my coaching to help you raise your hands a little bit higher, a little bit higher. So this is just a place that I like to start. It's an opportunity for reflection that sometimes, unless we're coached to go further, faster, higher, um, we kind of gate what you're asking us to do. And as a maybe counter to that, um, if any of you guys have kids, if you ask maybe your toddler or your four-year-old, I have a four-year-old, to raise their hands, they immediately shoot their hands all the way up to the sky. The sky is the limit. But something happens um, as we get older where we just kind of like take maybe the lazy approach and we raise them up a little bit. And it, again, takes that extra coaching to get all the way to the top. So what I really want to talk about today is this, this idea of how you can unlock your talent so that you're really getting hands all the way up to the ceiling, again, in service of problem solving in your organization. Okay, so step one um, in unlocking talent for problem solving is understanding your talent understanding your team. I will also offer that this really means understanding yourself as a leader and your role as well. And when I talk about understanding your talent, I look at kind of three different components of that. Your behavior, your purpose, and then your experience, what's in your briefcase and what you're capable of doing from a skills perspective. So just a couple of my tips here. Um, number one, I use something called predictive index. It's a behavioral analysis tool that looks at how you are predisposed to being, like what your natural behavioral tendencies are, and what you think you need to be in order to be successful in your organization. So this is one of mine from a while ago, but you can see on the top, this is my natural predisposition. So I'm independent, I'm very social, I'm a driver, I'm very flexible. And I was showing up in a really different way organizationally because that's what I thought I needed to be in order to be successful. So one of the opportunities here with just unlocking talent is, you know, see something like this as an opportunity to create better alignment. And the opportunity is you don't have to be different. You actually have to be exactly what you already are. And that's how you create the most value. So if anyone is curious to take this for themselves, I've got an assessment link here, or you can just shoot me a message after the fact. Okay, so this is my team through predictive index. So essentially everyone is plotted in these different quadrants based on their natural behavioral tendencies. And what this offers with problem solving is again, just an opportunity to understand who your talent is and how they're predisposed to working so that you can harness that in service of problem solving. 
So my team is a producing team. I've got a lot of engineers that work for me and we are an OPEX team. So we really focus on stabilizing, um, putting new processes in place, problem solving. So we are pursuing a stabilizing strategy. That's what's represented by these purple lines over here. So the offering here, again, is just in order to achieve this specific result, who do I need to rely on in order to help me do that? I am not the right person to really be um, leading the charge for process and precision because it's not really my natural tendencies. So in doing this, it just really allows you to build structure that supports your team in, again, achieving the results that they need to achieve. So once you know, you know, how you want to act, um, the other offering is just really why is it important to you to act? So I talk about work around core values. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with Simon Sinek's Start With Why, but he really talks about for organizations, if you understand your why and you understand the results that you want to achieve, the how is what differentiates it and makes you special. So with my team um, and with a lot of teams that I support, we do this type of work. And again, it's about creating individual and team awareness such that people know who they are in the context of teamwork and solving problems. Um, and lastly, as far as skills go, so this is another really fun exercise to just help people get curious about how they uniquely create value. Um, this is called zone of genius. So there's four different quadrants here, and the activity is just to fill in things for your individual quadrants. So zone of genius is where you are your absolute best. So the things that you love, the things that don't feel like work, um, peak abilities, and you're really passionate about this work. In contrast, zone of excellence is where you are highly skilled, but maybe you're not super passionate about it. And the opportunity I always give is I was a big construction project manager for years. So I have a lot of project management experience. People always love asking me to do that type of work, but I really, really don't love it. So that's kind of my zone of excellence. Uh, zone of competence is where you're okay at it. Other people are probably better and you don't really have any passion around it. And then zone of incompetence is where you kind of lack passion and you lack skill. So similar to everything else, this is just an opportunity, again, to get really curious with yourself and with your team about what lives in this zone of genius. For you to feel like you get to come to work every day and you're raising your hands all the way up, what type of work are you doing and how are you contributing? Amazing. So once you understand your team, the next thing that we're really going to focus on doing is understanding the problem. Um, and often, you know, I serve kind of internal teams, often as a consultant. So people come to me with problems, and then me and my team are going to go, you know, implement a solution. What I always say um, is, don't tell me the solution you want me to deliver. Tell me the problem that you're having. So I just offer that as a differentiator because sometimes we become really sure of what the solution is. Maybe you think you need to hire another person. Maybe you think that you need to use 5S as a tool, but you're not super clear on what problem you're solving. So in focusing on articulating the problem, it offers two things. We get to decide how. Right? You tell me if I need to climb a mountain or if I need to go swim, and I will figure out how I'm going to actually do that. Um, and it allows us opportunities to coach inside of our organization to help others get really good at articulating problem statements. Okay. So when I talk about defining problems, there's a couple different things that go into this. Um, so really it's just what's the problem, what's the KPI. So KPI stands for key performance indicator or really just how are you measuring success? Um, what's the impact of solving this problem? Is it caused or created? Um, what's the gap that that we finalizing an actual problem statement. 
So I just, I know it's kind of a cliche problem to talk through, but um, weight loss is just something really easy. But if we talk about, you know, losing weight, or if we just say the general problem is we want to get healthier, the offering here is that there's a lot of different ways that we can articulate that problem in a lot of different ways that we can measure success. So if I'm saying health is my overall goal, the problem I'm looking to solve, I can say I want to lose weight, and I can measure that by weight in pounds. I can measure that by my body mass index. The offering here is if your goal is to lose 30 pounds um, and you lost maybe 25, but you are in the best shape of your life, you have a tremendous amount of energy, and you feel really great, did you fail? So it's just picking ways of, you know, articulating the problem that allow you to like love the journey and really get to the place that you're intending to go. As an alternative, you could say the problem is I need to move my body more. Um, again, you're still talking about physical health, but how you're measuring success might be based on active minutes, daily step count, calories burned. So something like this is more of a leading indicator of success as compared to weight might be a lagging indicator of success. If I spend more time being active in the day, perhaps I will see a weight loss and therefore will become healthier. Um, lastly, again, just another alternative is wanting to create healthy habits. So really what I'm trying to emphasize here is, again, even in how we are measuring success and how we're articulating the problem statement, there are so many different ways that we can do this. So often with my team, we go through um, like divergent cycles where we actually brainstorm, like here's how the problem is presenting. Here's what we think we could do to measure it. Um, and we play with like alternative ways of articulating it and measuring it. And we talk about what would the journey be like? What would the stuff that we do be like if we chose to articulate the problem as A, B, or C. And this really just helps us, again, feel ownership of it and just set ourselves up for success. Great. Um, a couple other things whenever I'm talking about problem solving. So again, understanding the impact of the problem. Um, so what is the impact on you, your team, your customers, your company? Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have found myself either personally or professionally solving problems um, because, you know, they got talked about a lot or because, you know, they felt like a big deal only to realize that the impact of our efforts towards that problem um, were kind of not really like in the right spot. So it wasn't actually the biggest problem that needed to be solved. It wasn't really super impactful. So going through this exercise as you're setting up your problem solving can really just help you make sure that you're solving big problems and helps you create some intrinsic motivation around like what you're doing and how you're doing it. The next thing, um, I find it helpful to just talk about, is this problem that I'm solving a caused problem or a created problem? And the difference there is a caused problem is when you were previously able to achieve a standard. So I was always able to deliver 10 units per week. All of a sudden, two months ago, something changed and I've only been able to deliver seven. So you're looking back to understand what changed, when did it change, how do I get back to the place that I used to be? On the other side, a created problem is where you have never historically achieved the thing that you're looking to achieve. So I've historically been able to deliver 10 a week as a maximum, and now I need to deliver 20. So you can look back to get some information about what went well, but really you're asking more innovative questions to say, when do I need to achieve this new standard by? When do I, um, like, who do I need to get there? So you're creating a new problem. You're creating a new target. And again, this is just awareness to help you orient the type of questions that you're asking in a really meaningful way. Um, and one of the last things here is, again, just the gap analysis. So similar to that weight loss kind of um, 
problem that I pose, it's really important to figure out how are you measuring success? Where are you today? Where are you trying to get to? And what is the gap that you're trying to close? And this is just all in good define the problem so that we are all aware um, of the same definition of the problem. So if I today am delivering 10 and I'm going to deliver 20, um, I'm closing a gap of 10. So I know that, you know that. Um, it's just a really clear, crispy way to talk about how you're getting from where you are to where you want to go. Amazing. So once we've defined the problem, we are going to make a plan. Um, and what I'm talking about here, you know, is back outside of singular problem solving to more like organizational problem solving and how you're using your team. So um, I'll talk about like my case study and my problem in a little bit, but to introduce it now, um, essentially what my team does for our organization is we are working on generating cost reduction projects or getting more productivity out of our operation. So that is the overarching problem statement. Um, how we're measuring that is actually like, again, scrap reduction, defect rate reduction, um, increased operational productivity or labor utilization. So there's a couple different KPIs, but all under the umbrella of cost. So in making a plan, right, of how are we going to figure out how to solve this problem, it's the same as kind of what I offered where we're looking to come up with all of the different ways, right? So again, am I going to cut calories or am I going to take more steps in a day? So what are all of the different ways that we can think of organizing and doing a better job organizationally of solving cost problems? Once we have all of these different things, um, and again, you're asking, who do I have? Where are my strengths, right? Like all of that team awareness is running through your brain. You are going to converge onto a plan. Amazing. So again, some of the questions here, um, why are we here? What will we do? How will we get there? And what are the constraints? So something that I've been taught for many years, I've had the privilege of working with uh, Shingajitsu, the Japanese consulting firm. And one of my favorite things that their senseis have always said is no time, no money, no talent. So when me and my team think about problem solving, we're really trying to understand our, our constraints so that we're designing solutions um, where we can actually be really successful. So. I can solve 100 problems if you let me hire 100 people, but maybe that's not a super reasonable thing based on where my business is at. So understanding what you have to work with. So just, <clears throat> excuse me, um, good questions to ask that will help you come up with a plan of how do I need to move forward? Amazing. Um, the next step is just run the experiment. So I think really often we have a tendency to decide on the path that we're walking and we go all in um, and we don't give ourselves a lot of opportunity to continuously pivot and ask ourselves, is what we're doing actually helping? Are we solving the problem? So really, I consider all of the things that we do just an experiment. So again, our hypothesis is that if we do X, Y, and Z, the result that we generate will be we're going to decrease costs. We're going to increase productivity. So really just setting it up as such. Um, there's this idea that what we think about actually directly generates our results. So if you think of moving forward in a process as I'm running an experiment and I am going to learn something here, right? How that makes you feel is super curious, super excited, super motivated. And from that place, the actions that you take and the results that you generate are probably pretty amazing. As compared to um, maybe the thought of, I know the solution or there isn't a solution or this is hard, how that thought leaves you feeling is probably uninspired or rigid or 
you know, like you can't do a lot of creative things. And again, how you generate results from that place, um, probably not as ideal. So really just keeping oriented around this scientific thought process and running experiments is what we're going for here. Okay, so as I alluded to, um, one of the biggest problems that I've been working on for a bit is decreasing organizational cost, um, decreasing scrap, improving productivity. And again, now um, with no additional funding and no, you can't go hire people. So trying to figure out with my existing team, how can I be of service to my organization? How can we rally and help solve this problem? And so the experiment that we have been running um, is I reorganized my team. So as you guys saw at the beginning, I got really curious with my team about what their talents were, how they wanted to contribute, um, what was meaningful. And I used all of that information to partner with them to come up with a strategy that was really going to serve our organization. So historically, everyone on my team kind of worked pretty linearly. They were focused on their own projects. They had their own execution roadmap. Um, and we didn't really cross paths too much. Instead, what we've pivoted to is a tiger team approach. So my entire team hunts projects together Kaizen style. So instead of one project dragging out across a couple months, we hit it together as a team in a burst effort in an impact to define it solve it and sustain it in a very short amount of time. So we run Kaizen about every three weeks, where again, we pull together big teams of folks to help us execute on some of the biggest problems that our operation is facing. In conjunction with that, um, I really did want more talent. Um, and so the creative way that we have started doing that is we have brought in um, some of our union population. So we are a unionized plant. Um, there's a lot of cultural divides that come in that. But really, my theory was, of course, we have the talent. They're just busy pushing buttons on a machine. And we haven't unlocked them to serve us in the place that we really need to be focusing right now. So we started a pilot program uh, called a Kaizen Promotion Office, where my staff is leading different union folks on our team, again, in service of unlocking their unique capability to help us solve massive organizational problems. So what I love about this is we are breaking down cultural divides. We are equipping people to, again, find themselves and use themselves. So all of my union folks went through that same process of knowing who they are, their core values. So really, it's been super fun to get to offer that in this space. And they are contributing alongside of us in service, again, of solving these huge problems. And lastly, um, it's just really rigorous experimentation. So what's the plan? What are you going to do? Did the result generate what you thought? And now what are you going to do? So PDCA cycles, we have OpMEX that just keep us really true to, again, what's the target? Um, what happened? What do we think was going to happen? So a lot of that kata thinking, which teaches people, again, the methodology of problem solving and make sure that we're just with how fast we're moving, we are generating the results that we think we're going to be generating. Okay, so just a couple um, takeaways for you guys uh, based on my learnings here. So first off, uh, leverage your talent wisely. Um, I've had people work for me that, you know, six months before they came onto my team, they were lowest performers in our organization. So it is not about high or low performers. It's just about helping create that intrinsic motivation because everyone is capable of becoming an exceptional performer if you put them on a path where they can be successful. Um, intrinsic motivation, again, fueling success. So I never tell my staff what they have to do. I just really tell them what is what results I want achieved. So I need you to, you know, look in this area. I need you to increase productivity by 20%. How you get there, whether you use a screwdriver or a hammer or any other tool, 
that's your choice. And I'm here to help guide you as you play with different tools. Um, clarity in the problem definition, again, for our teams, for our stakeholders. So just really understanding um, what are we trying to do and what does success look like so that we can be deploying our talent in the right direction. Uh, continuous assessment and improvement. So this is just, again, that PDCA of I did a thing. Did it generate the result I thought? Yes or no? What am I going to do now? Same sustainability through the OpMEX. So building structure that enables you to do those routine checks um, so that you're constantly iterating on your process and moving forward. And lastly, um, big part of my leadership style is just celebrate everything. So failures are opportunities for us to say, what happened? What do we want to do now? What did we learn? Um, we have a bunch of really amazing successes as well. So just taking time to pause and recognize what's happening, what we're contributing, um, and again, celebrating people in ways that are meaningful to them. So it comes back to knowing your talent and knowing what they need um, and just giving them, you know, all of that affirmation in a way that really makes them feel lit up. Okay, so that is actually all I have. Um, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Um, I will definitely share my contact information. I would love for people to get in touch with me. Um, but with that being said, um, what questions can I answer for you guys? If anybody has a question, they can send it into the Q&A here. You have a lot of comments, Sarah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, somebody asked, is next steps regarding PDCA? Next steps regarding PDCA. Um, Matt, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by next steps? So let me, when I say PDCA, um, what we actually do, so we have a daily standup every morning. Yep, I gotcha. Um, we have a daily standup every morning. So we have, you know, all of the team members and our biggest priorities that we're working on. And every day I ask them to say, what are you doing today towards that priority? What result do you expect? Um, and what help do you need? And then let's say that's our Monday process. On Tuesday, I will say, what happened yesterday? Did you do what you said you were going to do? What was the impact of that? Um, and now what? So essentially, it's like kata, but we're running these little micro experiments that help us be able to both measure um, progress towards the goal and be able to like get them thinking about that feedback and not getting too solution oriented, but being able to keep questioning. Um, and what I use to track that, so we actually just do it on a whiteboard. Um, I've used Miro in the past, but with my union folks, it's just easier. We have it up kind of like in a big war room right outside of my office. Yep. Amazing. I do also analyze that. Um, like at a more strategic level. So every week I take a picture of it. And if I'm seeing any patterns of people not getting stuff done or the same type of stuff coming up, it allows me to, um, yep, do some trend analysis and really support them in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. Um, Sarah, real quick, they have asked for the link for the QR code. Um, yeah. So if you could send that to me and I can send that out with the presentation. You bet. I will send that and then, yeah, it'll come back out. It's like a five minute assessment. Okay. Um, and then do you see the next question? Um, yes. So if okay. you're in charge of the solution, how do you engage them to buy? Um, so it's really just walking with them. Um, so even though my team is like in charge of the Kaizen and in charge of like the implementation, um, we are really active with like change management and vetting the solutions as we go through it together. Um, so this involves, again, um, 
with our union population, like we'll go across the shifts, you know, let's say we're doing a line layout change, we'll do voting. So everybody gets a vote on option A, B, and C, and whatever you like the most is what we do. So it's really just communicating kind of where we are in the process and looking for really good points to solicit feedback. Um, and again, I think just like that vulnerability and honesty of saying, we don't really know if this is gonna work, but we want to try something. So I think in communicating that we're not implementing a solution, we're running an experiment to see if we can generate a result. People are more willing to play with us. And when we fail, it's it's not failure, right? Because it's just in the way that we're talking about what success looks like. How can how one can precisely reach? Um, and I think um, with regards to the question, how much time you have to spend on the plan phase, I think that really depends with, with some of the stuff that we do. Again, I'm asking them to plan like daily, um, just because that's how quickly we're moving right now. When we do the large Kaizen, it usually takes us a couple weeks to define the problem, gather the information and ramp to the point where in week Kaizen, we're implementing a solution. So, you know, we do PDCA on a daily basis with like how we're tackling smaller obstacles in the scope of our bigger problems. And then as we're running Kaizen, we obviously, the Kaizen itself, we have a plan that it'll generate a result. And we use bowling charts on the back end to track and trend the metrics to make sure that they're moving and stabilizing once we've implemented a solution. Um, roadblocks, uh, honestly, I can say um, one of the things that's worked really well is again, how we sold this program uh, as a pilot, as an experiment. I think what we originally expected was we would be able to move actually even faster than what we're moving now. So one of the roadblocks was just, you know, cautioning people. Yes, we have this powerhouse team. Yes, they're capable of solving problems. But I'm sure for those of you familiar with Kaizen, it's really actually hard to get everything implemented in a single week. Um, we have a lot of quality processes that we have to go through. Um, so sometimes we have to finalize things outside of the event. So our punch lists were just starting to grow. Um, so we needed to kind of ask for different types of resources, whether that be software resources, different types of quality resources to help us continue um, implementing at the rate that we wanted to. Um, so I think it was just that. It's just really, again, it comes back down to a lot of communication, a lot of pulsing what's going well, what's not. Um, there's this amazing tool that I learned of, uh, Jamie V. Parker, if anyone knows who that is, taught it on one of her podcasts, but it's called a plus delta. And I use it all of the time after events where essentially you're saying in the plus category, like tell me everything that went well with this event or this week. And then delta, it's not negative. It's not tell me everything that didn't work. It's tell me things would be better if. So it's really giving my team opportunities to like tweak and try for themselves. So I try to be super hands off and I just really show up to like serve and ask the questions of like, oh my gosh, all of this went so well. What do you want to do different next time? So again, just like creating space where instead of just go, 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 you actually are allowing people to think and orient. Um, the team is seven people. So I have four staff and I have three union people in my rotational program right now. Typically when we run Kaizen, we will take a couple folks um, from that specific part of the organization, like the actual process engineer that runs that line, the actual production lead on that line, and we'll integrate them into the Kaizen, which helps again with the solution sticking after we walk somewhere else. Um, how to know what, which problems should I start having in mind? Um, Jane, I don't know how to answer that question succinctly, but, um, if you want to reach out to me, I would be so happy to like talk through it with you and kind of help you look at the overarching problem statement and prioritize which things to go after first. Yeah. 
yeah, thanks for your input, Matt. Um, source of identifying problems. So we have Hoshin Conry for our organization. So, you know, we'll have a lot of um, problems organizationally. Like we just have some goals around scrap production. Um, when we talk about which problems my team is uniquely solving, they're usually, again, under the cost umbrella. And I will articulate the impact of the problem through a cost lens. And that's what really helps us to prioritize. Um, there are some things like operationally, again, a line layout might not be a big cost reducer, um, but it's a big service to the operations team. So I have regular um, meetings with um, like essentially the plant managers um, to just continuously say, here's what's in our pipeline. Is this still in line with like what you guys need us to be focused on? We talk about the results that we're generating. So it's just, again, staying really in tune with our stakeholders and our customers so that we're actually solving the right problems. Um, small orgs that have little data. Um, I don't know. Yeah, thanks. I don't know. Um, I think, Ken, my offering is you probably still understand um, what problems need to be solved. Um, I think when you don't have a lot of data, there's a couple cool tools um, to use. And again, I'd, I'd be happy to send you some of this if you email me. Um, I really like a FMEA. Uh, it's a failure mode effects analysis. So when you don't have data, essentially you're, you're using this tool to predict all of the ways that your operation or your process could fail. Um, in using this approach, it allows you to quantify risk, and then you can make a Pareto based on that, and you can start going after eliminating risk from that perspective. Um, also just, you know, using a fishbone. So even if you don't have data, but you have a delivery problem, um, asking, you know, what are all of the things that could be contributing to this, um, doing the brainstorming activity. And then again, just focusing on designing an experiment. So I think I have, I know I have a delivery problem. Um, I, I think that it's maybe because I have machine downtime. Um, I am going to run an experiment where I watch this machine for a week. I, you know, put a check mark every time the machine's down for longer than 30 minutes. And you're just trying to prove to yourself that your hypothesis this is again directionally correct. The walk when you work on. Um, I'm not super. You betcha, Ken. I'm not super familiar with Quality Circle. Um, that nomenclature. I think with Gemba walks. Um, what I make that to mean is essentially like the leader standard work that helps integrate the solutions that we put in place. So my team all builds leader standard work. I mean, as part of the Kaizen, um, one of the things they walk out with is like, how does this integrate so that we, again, monitor and stabilize the results? So we encourage our production team leaders to have this. So in week, we're working with them on, we set a new standard. How often do you need to come monitor to this standard? Um, what do you do if the standard isn't being met? And kind of like, what's the process around that? My team has their own leader standard work, work um, focused around like the actual um, solutions or like the um, the process itself. So um, it's just looking at, again, is the visual management working? Is the process doing what it's intended to? Are the leaders doing their leader standard work as intended? So really just focusing on, you know, stabilizing the mechanisms around the changes. Um, and then I have leader standard work as does a lot of our senior leaders to again, just like support the change for our frontline leaders. Um, is SDCA say do check act. I'm not familiar with that acronym. Sarah, I believe it is. Okay. Um, I think say do check act feels similar. Again, I don't, I've not used that one at GE. Um, the plan do is just like, what are you going to do? Then go do it. 
I, I feel like SDCA, if it's say do, is probably really similar um, or yeah, set a standard and then execute to it, check and act. Um, I think it's all the same intention. So it's all just about that, you know, again, scientific experimentation. Yep. Um, I find that everywhere I go, there's lots of different, um, we all talk about very similar concepts with very different nomenclature, so. Um, resources, courses, books. Um, I think Matt, I, I would ask like, what problem are you trying to solve? So if it's like general lean knowledge, if it's more like, you know, how to support teams at a high level, if it's more strategic lean leadership, um, I read a ton, uh, happy to make some recommendations, but if you could tell me a little bit more of what you're looking to do. Um, Sarah, we did have a question come in too that says regarding the three week cadence you mentioned for your Kaizen team, are you holding these Kaizans in a manufacturing space? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We are actually on the manufacturing shop floor. Um, we've done a couple Kaizans that are more information uh, focused, but we really specialize in driving and sustaining the changes um, in manufacturing on the floor. ASQ courses. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, TPM is a cool tool. Um, I, I am not a huge fan of courses. I guess I, I just mostly like to try stuff internally. So, um, I'm constantly looking just for different methods that I can try on with my team and they do the same. So we like LinkedIn, um, we like podcast. Um, and then once we hear something, we'll just say, how can we integrate this and how can we try it? So, um, one of my favorite things that I've ever done was again, get certified as a coach. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, um, I was told my whole life that I was being coached, um, but I wasn't, I was being either mentored or I was being led. Um, so really understanding how to show up for people in that totally different way has really served me in my leadership journey. Um, podcast recommendations. Um, I love the, the Gemba Academy podcast. I think that one's great. And Ron always has really great guests. Um, people solve problems is another really great podcast. Um, and Matt, I can share, I'll, I'll have to like look at um, my list, but I'll definitely share some other ones. I'll make a note. Um, how did you do that to get certified to be a coach? Um, I was part of a program at GE where we brought in um, some executive coaches. Um, so we were part of like a masterclass to do executive leadership development internally. Um, so as I went through that program, I got to work with an executive life coach. That's how I learned the difference. And it was through that experience that I actually decided to go through the process myself. Okay, Sarah, we are at 245. So I am going to shut it down. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time. You were great. Um, also, we did have a question if the presentation will be shared as well. Sure. Okay. I, I will share that with you, I presume, and then you are welcome to blast it out to the network. Okay, awesome. Perfect. Okay, so everybody, just a quick reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you to everybody who participated and sent in your question, questions. That was awesome. Sarah, thank you again, and we will see you all next time. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Bye.